Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Superhero Finer podcast. As always, I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and I'm scouring the cosmos. Space is behind me. I'm out here looking for the people with the most inspiring stories, some epic journeys that they've been on, or challenges that, do you know what, is well spent being able to send out into the universe to be able to help other people. So whether you're here to take something away for yourself, whether you're here because you want to take some something away that you can help somebody else with, whatever your reason for being here, thank you for being here. And I'm delighted to be in the virtual studio with Ethan and Matthew. How are you doing? We're good. Yeah, we're doing well. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Trying to choose who went first then. Yeah. It's like we're least we're like sat next to each other because usually we're all doing it like separately over yeah. Zoom. So it's harder to kind of go, no, you do it. No, you yeah, do yeah. it. Like whatever. But we can kind of like make really... Yeah. Dead, like, we can read to be like, other. yeah, I wish we can read each other. <laughs> yeah, so if, yeah, so if like you're listening book. to yeah. this and you're not got the video, you're gonna miss out on a lot of this. But if you're watching the video, you'll see the dynamic between these two. I think it's gonna be quite cool. <laughs> so, comedy. Ethan and Matthew, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if you could just introduce a little bit about what you guys do about yourselves to the people listening. You're the director, sir. So. Yeah, so um, we're from a group of Liverpool-based filmmakers called Some Guys With A Camera. We first formed in 2018 when me and my brother John met Connor, our mate, on a filmmaking course at a local cinema. We started after that just making our own films because we really enjoyed what we'd done on there. And we thought, well, no, let's just not put this to waste. You know, we clearly get on well. We clearly make stuff good when we're together. So we then started making our own projects. A couple of years down the line, um, Ethan got involved and has joined us to make our biggest project yet, which is a six-part miniseries called Birchall's Pints about a craft brewery, which will be streaming on Amazon Prime on Friday the 10th of November. <clears throat> not long yeah, now, then. Uh, Three days. No, no. Yeah, not at exciting. All. Yeah. Um, and I'm Ethan Campbell. Uh, as Matt said, I joined uh, a couple of years after the formation of Some Guys With A Camera. Uh, I joined after I met Connor in college. Uh, we became really good mates. Uh, I wanted to make films, and he knew the right people to like get me involved in his level. Um, and since then, I just got they just snatched me up really, and yeah, they've not let me go since. Perfect. It's it's yeah. the way best. It's the way teams work, right? Get in yeah. here. You're not going. You're too valuable. Yeah. <laughs> no one's paid the ransom, unfortunately. No, no one. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about Birchall's Pints then. Is this the first kind of project that's going to be on something like Amazon Prime or have you done them all? We've had um we've had short films on Prime in the past. So I made a film called Blackbird, which was like a 1980s revenge drama set in the Thatcher era. I've made Knoll, which was like a heartwarming twist on like a Christmas film. Um, but they're not on Prime anymore because they don't stream short films on there. And uh, also they were like 20 minute films made on literally zero pounds. Whereas Virtual's Pints is definitely the first thing of this scale. And it's definitely the first thing that will exclusively be on Prime. That's really exciting. So how does that, like that blows my mind getting something on because we all use Prime, we all use Netflix, we all use all these services. How does that come about then? With Prime Video, it's not that hard. At all, it re it really just comes down to a a form you fill out, and um, they might be fairly strict with it, and it might sort of be like, if it's not professionally made, then it has to be something that we like. We're yeah. just so lucky that someone, uh, a prime video has clearly got a sense of humour deranged enough to enjoy better than <laughs> <writing, laughs> put it on the platform. Would you would you compare it to anything else that's out there? Was there anything that influenced it? Oh yeah, there was a plenty of stuff. That oh, was, so yeah. much. I've never been. I've never thought what would be the one, uh, the one thing that's influenced it. Yeah, there's no one like because there's elements from like say it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Sorts. Yeah, but it's very it's very situational. Like a lot of the old comedy. Yeah, like a friends meet like and then quite British like Faulty Towers and Peep Show and quite British as well. And um, yeah. BoJack Horseman's a big inspiration. The Netflix like cartoon. Um, because I think that can just be the daft thing you've ever seen and then the next scene will just be so depressing it's like that took me off guard because the first scene was so funny then the yeah. second is so depressing and i i, I binge that whilst writing this because it, it gave me a lot of inspiration for the kind of tonal yeah tonal changes so yeah it's quite a mix yeah it's quite a mix in this show uh of emotions it's a lot of joy a lot of embarrassment a lot of like cringe moments and then a lot of emotion quite sensitive at times um 
you know, characters that you would think, uh, say for my, for example, my character, David Bugle, um, you would think aren't really there to be, you know, an emotional or sensitive character. They're there yeah. for just the comic relief. And then the, sh- the further the show goes on, the more we explore them as people. Uh, and they be- they just they become more three dimensional. Yeah, I love that. So there's a almost a story arc within the six within the yeah, yeah, yeah. series of episodes. Yeah, are you both acting in it, or is it just yourself, Ethan? That's dual roles. Uh, as of the two of us, it's just me. Um, I did have a character, but he was cut because he was too annoying. Yeah. And maybe really? one day, maybe one day we'll release that deleted scene. But yeah, there was a character yeah. that I played that. He was, I mean, he was meant to be annoying, but yeah. maybe it went a little bit too through the roof. <laughs> and I probably, I think I, I do intend on releasing the deleted scene, I think. Yeah, one day, you It's know. just, it, it's good on its own, but like you put it in the show and it's like, what on earth is going on here? Yeah, it just, so, it's so out of left field. It just knocks you like a ton of bricks. But that's to suggest that not, that everything else isn't, uh, yeah, like, yeah, everything yeah. else is like that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so technically I'm the only one that, uh, the two of us has got a role in it. I I play David Bugle, who is uh like this bumbling, idiotic Tory MP who's blackmailed by the Birchall brothers to uh propose a change in the beer tax in Parliament so that the Birchalls, who are known for the stronger beers with the higher percentage, don't face as, as high a tax, which will help right. them uh with the business which is struggling at the time of the show. Okay, that's cool. I just had thoughts then of this of this cut scene. Turning like Peep Show into the Mighty Boosh, or just something. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's a really good comparison. To yeah. Me. No, yeah. The M- Manny is a Mighty Boosh character in a Peep Show type. Yeah, series. maybe we'll, we'll release the Reynolds cut a few years down yeah, the line, yeah. like Zack Snyder with the, just this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> put it in black and white. Very. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so introduce us then to a few of the other characters, just so we can get a bit of a taste before people watch on the tenth. Yeah, so the brewery is run by two brothers. Um, the main, the one we kind of focus on here is William Birchall, who's played by my own brother, John Reynolds. And he is around all these crazy, hardened, bloodthirsty people, but he is honestly very soft. I think when he gets a few pints in him, he can like rile up the crowd. We see mm-hmm. him uh, seen in episode one and he's motivating them all. He sounds so power hungry. And it just cuts to him on his own, just having a drink. Like, he can't fit in at his own party, um, but he's got this responsibility on his shoulders that he clearly is no longer capable of handling. Right. And then his brother, his younger brother, Thomas is like, so if Will is the CEO, Thomas is like the general manager. He deals with the day-to-day runnings of the brewery and he is, he's fascinating. He's very, very masculine, but he's, um, he's got a softer side. He's gay. He's got a ro- bit of a romance with another character called Jerry. Um, he runs a brewery, but he doesn't drink. I just find that there's a lot of inconsistencies with Thomas's mindset that make yeah. him really interesting. I mean, as, as people, despite the fact that they're brothers as people, the night and day. Uh, the two main characters completely different. Yeah, Will I think is a lot more peaceful. Uh, he's a lot more compassionate, whereas Thomas is a lot more ruthless. Uh, he's more ambitious. Uh, he's he's really determined. Um, I think Will wants Will wants to surround himself with good people and make good like have good times and make good memories. Whereas Thomas wants control, money, power. Uh, not to say that he's an outright villain. Um, but he did. He just he. He strives for different things and is for so vastly different things in his life than Will does. Yeah, it sounds like he's driven for financial success for the kind of yeah. ego boost that it gives you from getting that. Yeah. I do wonder, was any of this, any of the storylines loosely based on any experiences you guys have been through, or were they were they inspired by anyone? A couple of people have, um, and I think this is definitely like subconscious. It's like a metaphor for like our whole experience. Like sometimes the camera's run by a couple of brothers. Not to say that me and John are anything like that. Yeah. We've just come across people in our time, and it's like, yeah, just the experience of like all these mates running this one company, and just the counter in all these crazy scenarios that keep going on around them. There's some some of that definitely, I'd say, inspired this. Indirectly. Yeah, I'd say characters were inspired by things. Um, yeah. I think we've yeah. got we've not only were some characters written for people that we'd worked with before that we wanted to bring into Birchall's, but some characters were based on people we've met in real life. We won't name names. Um, and then <laughs> some characters were based on 
sort of wider real world stuff. Like I think we've mentioned a couple of times in a couple of different shows that uh, David Bugle yeah. was very much a product of 2020. Um, yeah. David Bugle was like four northern teenagers that didn't feel represented by anybody in Parliament. Um, basically saying this isn't just Tories, this is all politicians. You're all idiots. Like yeah. you have, you have. There's no mandate. Nobody votes for any of the new prime ministers anymore. Um, nobody's got any direction. Um, and it, it, it essentially just the country's problems are um hot potato between prime minister to prime minister. They're not going to get solved. Nobody represents. The majority of the country anymore. The working class is no longer represented, um, but politicians are so utterly tone deaf as well. Um, and we saw that and thought these people are so unbelievably out of touch with actual reality that yeah. it is comedic. Yeah. And that's where David Bugle came from. Was not yeah, sure we don't feel represented by politicians anymore, um, but also at the same time, um, at the same time, uh. Someone's just come into the room and it's thrown me off completely. Uh, at the at the same time, the people that are there are so bad at doing their jobs that it is laughable. So David Bugle was to point out the comedy in the incompetence of modern day politicians. Yeah. So actually, it's there's some really <laughs> powerful kind of really recent and relevant messages in there about yeah. how society is feeling, but then wrapped in a bit of comedy. So it's not. Particularly, it's not necessarily designed to be difficult to watch, but it's making a very prompt statement. Yeah. But wrapped nicely, so you can enjoy it and you can take whatever you want from it. I think there's a lot of that in the show's themes as well, because the show might do a lot of silly stuff and it might have all like these big, lively moments with this rock soundtrack that's putting all these characters in mad situations to make people laugh. But there's also like a very consistent theme of like mental health, friendship, you know, well-being, um, togetherness and sort of bonding as people, growing as people, um, and like how important it is to just take care of yourself, not just physically but mentally as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I've I do a lot of work in the mental health space. I speak yeah. to a lot of people in the kind of mental health and the challenges arena. Have you guys had any challenges in the in the kind of mental health space? Because I know there's a comment on that in there. I just wondered whether yeah. there's any experience you can give. I think because it was written in lockdown, it's very right. clear that this was written by, like, so I wrote the script. I obviously, like anyone, struggled with, like, loneliness during lockdown. Like, yeah. it was illegal to meet your friends. And the amount of, no amount of times that I can say the sentence, it was illegal to meet your friends out loud will ever make me understand that that was a real thing, that it was illegal to meet your friends. And yeah. we've all just gone about life it going, oh, oh, it was illegal to meet your yeah. mates. Yeah, that is yeah. the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> um, no matter how justified it was, I'm not even, I'm not like saying oh, it yeah, wasn't yeah. justified. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, like that had repercussions and that meant that, you know, like at a very pivotal time in my life when I just turned 18, I should have been like, like enjoying the benefits of having just turned 18, having just finished college. And I found myself at home instead writing a TV show about people who did go out and did make friendships and have all this fun. So yeah, I think it was clearly written by, written when we weren't in, when we were like kind of longing to have that back, to have that community spirit back and that camaraderie. And ironically, I think that pro like doing this project and some guys with the camera in general, um, got a lot of people, got a lot of us out of that, uh, for me specifically, like 2020, I mean, we've all had struggles with, with mental health and stuff, but I was in a awful place. Um, and it, it got darker and darker as the pandemic went on and as we had more lockdowns. College at that point, me sixth form was a write off. Me A level was a write off. I just didn't, I, I knew that I just wasn't, I didn't have it in me anymore to like yeah. try and get to a point where I'd have something to like, I, I wasn't going to be able to propel myself into uni at that point. The only thing I had was how Connor's introduced me to his mates and they all seem nice and they all seem to do what I want to do. Like yeah. some guys with a camera was the only lead I had into like a, a successful, happy life with good mental health, which at the point I didn't like it was it was awful it was getting dangerous um and working more and with some guys with the camera doing more projects with them um turned everything on its head mm. and it just started going up and uh 2021 was 
like the 2021 was the was the year I think I made all of the memories that sort of made me a, who I am. Um, okay. and I think that's the case for a lot of people that worked on Birchers. A lot of people are who they are because of it, whether they work in TV and film right now or not. Um, I think it affected everyone that worked on it, especially the lesser experienced actors. A lot of people, this was their first project. Um, so I think it it changed a lot of people that were just coming out of really dangerous mental places because of the pandemic. Yeah, that that's awesome to hear because I know, you know, I'm sure there's many people that'll agree with you how difficult it felt um, the lockdown was. And it was difficult for different degrees, different yeah. degrees for everybody. Um, but just the isolation, I found yeah. I found that I went from seeing face to face over a hundred people a week as a mm-hmm. personal trainer, as running classes, um, to then seeing nobody, and it was yeah. like somebody just taking your legs, you know, yeah. because it's because it's something that something that drives you in that energy. But to hear that story of actually how, you know, meeting some meeting some people that are now friends that you enjoyed doing as well, it wasn't just something to do; it's something yeah. you need to do. And finding that, and yeah, finding it wasn't. Training. It wasn't just like oh, I'll go to council and and everything's better. Yeah. It was, it was becoming better mentally through, I suppose, quite a non-conventional way. Yeah. Um, because you know it, it it's not every day that you hear oh I got out of my uh, dark mental space by making a TV show. That's not it's not yeah. every that's never an everyday thing. Um. But yeah, so it's like, but because everyone was so passionate about it and because everyone wanted a career in this enough, at least at the time, um, you know, people just thought, well, I've got, I've got something now. I've got, yeah. uh, basically, I've got a reason to, to get up in the morning yeah. and go out of the house. Yeah. Um, and I've got people waiting for there for me that genuinely value me, enjoy speaking to me, value me time. Uh, it does... It it just it it changes you completely. If you're in that place and then you get immediately whisked off to this massive thing, it yeah it changes you. Yeah, I think that's a really important point just to set on for a second. And if if you're listening and you've got you know you got a friend that's maybe going through something similar or or you yourself are as well, somebody or something that can give you purpose, something that fits with who you are, and people that mm-hmm. also hold you accountable but just know nothing but love for you, are probably the most important people in your life at that point. And spending as much time as you can with them, I think, is a huge thing, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So when this, so the Virtual Pints releases on Friday, on the tenth. What does yeah? What does success look like to you guys then? Now, it, obviously, it's going to be on there, which is cool. But have you got anything that's going to make you go, well, actually, it's worth doing something else? Or I yeah, because we've we've said like for a while, like at what point? Like I I think what I've said to you, Ethan, is like we'll know it when we see it. Like, I'll just know that it's done well. Like, I know that sounds really pretentious. No, like, no, no. There'll yeah. be a point where, like, I think I, a personal goal of mine is for it to be the most viewed thing we've ever done. But the previous most viewed thing was on YouTube for free. This is obviously paid yeah. on Prime. Yeah. So it, yeah. it, only in the UK. It's only going to be in the UK as well. So, you know, it's, it, it's going to be a lot more, difficult to get this having more views than yeah. the stuff that was out there for free we know that yes. but if it ever gets close to the most viewed thing we've done that would i think it's also because it's the biggest scale project we've ever done then um the benchmark for success is obviously also like the biggest we've ever done as well yeah. Yeah, so we I, I think it's difficult for us to say what success looks like because we've not we've not seen the level before where we can say, oh, this was successful. Mm. Um, we can just only hope we get there. And I think we'll know it when we see it. Um, but I think something uh, to, to say about Birchall's is it is the epitome of everything that Some Guys With The Camera was made for. Um, mm-hmm. The group was made because, I mean, obviously I wasn't there at the time, but the group was made because three lads that were from half of England that they knew they weren't going to get many chances in the career they wanted. They knew that they'd been born on the wrong half of the country to just get a career, and that would be it. Um, some guys with a camera was made because, though Matt, John, and Connor knew that nobody was going to come along and do it for them, they had to do it themselves. Um, it's where the name comes from, because it's just three, it was just three guys, yeah, making whatever they could, um, whatever they could come up with and whatever they could conceivably shoot. 
uh, but Birchall's is that as well. Because we were going to do just a pilot. We were going to crowdfund for just a pilot and then try and shop it around. Um, but we thought, well, if we're crowdfunding mm. for it, if we're I mean, going to all that effort, yeah, just make the make the series. Imagine if we were on it now, going, oh, it's just the one episode, and it's like, well, yeah, what's yeah. the point then? Like, yeah, if we're gonna make it, let's make it. Yeah, yeah. um, I think yeah, I, we, we, I think we just realized like, well, this isn't what some guys with the camera do. Some guys with the camera, if they've got a story, they just make it. They don't wait for anyone. Um, so we thought, why not just fund for the whole show and do it ourselves? Um, That's incredible. Uh, yeah. you, you know, getting some, getting something that you want to do, and just applying it, and just going for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, I think because of that, and because Birchall's has built on those values, um, I think season two would be as well a potential season two. That I would say, um, I think so. If we were to say, oh, this was successful enough, let's try and give it another go. I think it would more come from the fact that we would have something, and we just want to do it. Um, whether people have seen the first season or not, if we felt like we were at a position to give this another shot and it would be worth it and it would satisfy us and it would, we'd enjoy the project and it would come out in a product that was definitively better than the first season. I think we'd absolutely do it. And I don't, I don't know if audience back would have much of a say in it because it would just come down to a wee passionate enough to do it. I think it's supply and demand. I think like, season two is only going to be watched by as many people that have watched season one, if not less. So I definitely, you know, I'm not going to make it if no one's going to watch it. Like if this does well and people are, people are on their hands and knees begging for it, we will make it. Um, it's as simple as that. Yeah. But again, I think at the end of the day, if we've got, say if we had all six to eight episodes and we were like, we reckon we could do it properly. And we knew Birchall's had been seen by people. I think that would be enough for us to just want to do it. We're not, we're not trying to massively up the scale we're not trying to do anything special we're just we've got the story it feels like Birchill's it is Birchill's mm. and we'll just we'll do it for the same reasons that we did the first one because yeah. no one's going to wait for us to do anything else yeah so I sense a little bit of difference between the two of you but what I think you're actually saying is we're going to do it because we want to do it yeah yeah, yeah. not just because it's going to make us money or it's going to get us views or whatever but there needs to be a line where actually if it, if it completely flops and no one watched it, then what would be the point in making another one? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's got to be a line there, hasn't there? Both, yeah, both yeah. factors, definitely. And, you know, like well, me, yeah. and, me and Ethan were almost infamous for, for our disagreements on set. Like, yeah. like it was like chalk and cheese almost. But like, what what are you doing collaborating with someone who says yes to everything you say? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. John says he always... I know John says he always wants to bang our heads together, like the amount of times yeah. he said that phrase, but like I wouldn't want someone that I was working with who just said yes to everything. And, and then someone who put up a bit of a fight. Maybe end, not as much as you, at, but at the, <laughs> at the end of it, at the end of the two months, at the end of the shoot, uh, I think the moment you said that to rap on Bertel's point, we just breathed a big sigh. Mm. And I think it's on video somewhere, but it was just like this massive embrace. It was, it was like, like a like, cease ceasefire. We've been, <laughs> we've, just been, we've been through a lot together. Yeah. Um <laughs> But yeah, I think yeah, there's a middle ground there where you've got to think. But if the if plenty of people watch it and plenty of people wanted a second season, but we didn't feel like we had one any sort of any skin in the game, or we didn't have the story to do it, I don't know if we would. I think we would just try and reapply that audience to something else. Um, but I think there is there is passion for the show because it's done so much for us. And that just comes down to you wanting to do it for the right reasons, because you'd be able yeah. to put everything into a second season, not yeah, half-ass yeah. it, or not be fully engaged with it, because it's ultimately shows, the product shows what you guys are about, doesn't it? So if your shop yeah. window then loses quality for the sake of doing it, then yeah, yeah, yeah. good anyway, does it? What would yeah. you say to somebody if they were thinking now, right, do you know what? I fancy having a go at this. Now, it's a big journey. Where did you mm. guys start? What was the first thing you did? And is there any tips you can give anyone? Buy a camera. Yeah. 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 I think that I mean, we, that's all we had to start off with. Uh, hence why it was some guys with a camera. Yeah. We didn't have a microphone. We didn't have a we didn't have lights. We didn't have be really editing software. It was just a cut that we that was all we did have. Mm. Um yeah, I think it's just I think just like be patient with the process. I remember when I first started out, I did not like what I was doing. And to some degree, like I'm not, you know, I don't want to be making things of like I want to 
be making things of better quality than virtual spanks in the future obviously but i think it's just to be patient and also just to look back at what you did years ago and go look at the progress in those five years where am i going to be in another five years you've got to keep just allowing yourself to enjoy how far you've come yeah nobody um other than i don't know uber rich people who've already got parents in the industry ever start out with anything more than just a camera you're not going to have gimbals and tripods and dollies and audio equipment and lights and you're not going to have all this crew you're just going to have whatever camera you can get your hands on um and that's it if you want if you want to start off and you want to do it independently that's where you're going to start off um but it's just about every time you've got an idea just get it down and film as much as possible i suppose it, it it's it feels like an easy thing to say but it's just if you want to make films and just do it um if you want to make films just shoot 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 it doesn't it, like especially early on it doesn't matter what it is uh or what the quality is mm. um you've just you've got to get something out there you've got to teach yourself on the job practically how you're getting better and yep. then you've got to just keep adding um adding equipment and, and experience and adding technique Because I'm am I right in saying from from your experience, you're better having something out there that there's a really good idea for a, maybe a story or passion. There's passion there, but the quality is dire in effect if it's your first camera or whatever it is, rather than having something that's really glossy that has no substance. Yeah, that's kind yeah. of what I'm all about. Like the amount of just honestly, I'd say about ninety percent of films of our level crystal clear video crystal clear like audio so well done the acting is atrocious and i mean unwatchable like i like it might be easy for me to say because like all my friends are actors and i'm not bashing anyone of our level but oh my gosh do they only focus on the technical stuff and not the writing and the the heart and the acting and i mean that's what sometimes the camera's all about. Like, yeah. um, it's not, you know, it's not IMAX level footage or like crystal clear sound, but there's so much kind of energy behind it. And I think that's harder to achieve in a way. No, it absolutely is. Um, I think, yeah, sure. If you're trying to teach yourself some technical skills and brilliant, but if you're putting a story out there for the world to see, mm. um, it's got to be something that, that is worth watching. And oftentimes they are quite shallow and they don't have substance and it's not three dimensional. Um, and I, I think a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people try and put something out there for the sake of it. But if you're going to release something and want people to watch it, yeah, it's got to be something that comes from you. It's got to be authentic and it's yeah. got to mean something to you. If it's going to mean something to anyone else, if you've not put love into it, it's not going to be loved by anyone. Yeah. I think there's a lot. Thank you for that. I think there's a lot that you've shared today that people are going to be able to resonate with. And I think there's a lot of really good tips in there. Um, Now, I do think it'd be rude if I didn't mention, I'm sure he's going to love this, Leon's name. So no, Leon introduced (laughs) us to you guys. And obviously he he stars in it as well, doesn't he? Um, Yeah. Just wanted to put that in for him. And and what it'll do is it'll prove whether he listens to it to the end, you see. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If he he skips his out, you've not mentioned me. Yeah. um, (laughs) Then, you know, we we all know um we know how dedicated he is, but now he's amazing. Um, I absolutely loved him. Um, I think he was a lot of people's rock on yeah. that on that set. He he's just... got a fantastic role as well. So yeah. he's credited in the show as Philip Redgrave. Um, so if anyone's looking at it, yeah, he plays Alfie Giggelsberg, who's like a. I mean, he's like the stereotype of the popular kid, and he's the antidote to everything that Birchall's is not. You know, he's yeah. trendy, he's well liked, yeah. he's popular. Joe Rogan fan. Yeah, Big yeah, Joe exactly. Um, I just, yeah, I thought it was well funny because Phil's nothing like that. Yeah, Phil's nothing like that at all. <laughs> and if he was on here, um, because I know you're a PT, if he was on here, I know he'd want me to mention uh, that he did train for Alfie as well. Um, uh, yes. Because we knew what type of person he was going to be. Um, he asked us if there was anything that we wanted in general, uh, and I told him. I think we sort of both had agreed, but I think he wanted to hear it from us. Um, I remember telling him that Alfie should, because he's so elegant and because he's so shallow and he's this like cocky sort of supermodel that everyone loves, but nobody, everyone likes, but nobody loves. Um, I think he's got to just be top heavy. He's got to be one of those guys that skips legs and just, just does all the glamour (laughs) muscles and stuff like that. Um, But I think 
the fact that he asked us to do that uh, showed how dedicated he was to it. Um, nobody else was going to ask us how they wanted how they wanted us to uh, for them to train in the gym for the role. Um, I don't know if it applied to anyone else, but still. No, that's, uh, I mean, but, yeah, it's no very, specific, gonna, like, very specific. <laughs> no, no other characters needed. Yeah, any other like, people? Yeah, people grew people grew beards and things yeah, for yeah. this, like. There's a stereotype of people into craft beer having beards. So yeah, people like John <laughs> yes, really big beard. Oh, John John's couldn't wait huge... to shave it off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um I don't yeah. know if I've seen John with a beard since he shot beard. Well he's got like, he's always had a beard, but maybe not, not not a craft beard. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> often more clean shaven than he is not. I wouldn't say so. I'm I mean maybe I've just not seen him enough. Um but yeah, I think because of how special it was and because of how big it was for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people were willing to put a bit of extra care and hard work into making the character as believable as possible. So when someone did grow a beard or when someone did go to the gym and start training specific parts of the body to look a certain way, um, or they started t- uh, taking in certain you know media, um, I know I, even though I swore off, I know I started watching the news a fair bit more when I got cast as David just to see you know Matt Hancock and. <laughs> Boris Johnson and then Liz Truss and yeah, just all those absolute buffoons. Um, yeah, so I think a lot like the scale of it and how passionate everyone was about it drove everyone to be just that little bit more dedicated and that little bit more hard yeah. work than he would usually yeah. be to just a just another independent student project. Oh, it's incredible. Really, really good. And it shows the, the calibre of people that you've chosen and the kind of the ethos that you've got around you have been working. I've got one question for you both, which I always ask my guests, because I love superheroes, as does Leon as well. But if you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? What would you use it for? Ooh. Ooh. That's a that's that's, that's yeah. a question. That is a quest that's one it of is. the questions. That's many of the questions. Yeah. Um hmm. you must have a stock answer for this, because you're probably you're a bigger like comic fan than me. I feel I like do, you, you know. you're privy to more. I think um, I'm I'm a cameraman full I'm a cameraman full time now, so it's a lot of like like lugging big heavy equipment across very long distances. So I think if I was able to teleport, life would just be so much easier. No more four hour drives to London. And if I could just like, oh, we need this trolley of equipment to take into like crew, cool. Yeah. Off I go. Um and and then I'm in crew and then I'm really sad. Yeah. Well, can you imagine you'd just be able to transport yourself to another country? No, I know, yeah. There's an no earthquake more, yeah, right yeah. on there. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah, I was gonna say like fly in for the same reason, but I've realized like teleporting would be so much quicker than flying. Because yeah. flying you've got to I mean you've got to, it. to fly, but you've got to do that for like whatever. Also, I couldn't fly with all our equipment. No, that's the yeah, that's the point. Really you'd, have to, you'd have to do like a combo deal, like where you get like flying yeah, yeah. and super strength, but then you may as well just get the one that's teleportation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like buy one, get one free. Yeah, they're not going to do that. Yeah. You're not going to hide no. superhero people. No, they've not got special offers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like a market. No. <laughs> get, get a bog off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> guys, it's been lovely to speak to you. If anyone wants to follow you guys on social medias and stuff, please let us know how they can do so. We are at some guys with a camera on Instagram at SGWAC on X or as I call it, Twitter. Um, or some guys with a camera on Facebook. Brilliant. And just remind everyone, what show is it and when's it out? And what? On? Virtual's Pints is on Amazon Prime on Friday the 10th of November. If you just search for Virtual's Pints, it should come right up. Yeah. It'll be recommended on all your favourite shows if you if it's worth watching for you as well. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Friday the 10th. Mark it Friday the 10th. It is the day. We expect lots of reviews. If you do watch it, let us know how it is. And if you don't watch it, why not? Yeah. That's <laughs> At least give the first one a go, right? That, you've got to do that, haven't you? Especially when... Yeah, you've got to get yeah. the first one a go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been fantastic to have you on. Um, thank you, everyone, if you have been listening. Thank you again for reaching the end. I know we've all got very busy lives. Hope you've enjoyed that. And from myself and from Ethan and another Matthew, so two Max, <laughs> stay super, everyone.